All right. Hey, everyone. We are live today. We're here with Nicole Stevens. Hi, Nicole. Hi. <laughs> um, we're, <laughs> we're both happy to be here. And Nicole, it's going to be casual. We're <laughs> going to be great. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the topic of today is a day in the life of a freelance instructional designer. So um, I met Nicole at the beginning of last year in the boot camp. Nicole put together a really, really strong portfolio. And then kind of like, it seemed like that had like a full client load and was referring clients out to other people in the community. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about how Nicole did that as well as what Nicole's days look like now as like a full time and very busy, maybe even too busy <laughs> uh, freelancer. So we're going to get into all of that here. Um, and thank you all for joining us live. So Nicole... Yeah. I guess before we get too deep into it, can you tell us a bit about how you came to freelance instructional design work? <laughs> sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, I started back a while back, <laughs> back in the late 90s, actually. Um, uh, it's, it's a strange path how I got here. I never really kind of pictured myself here um, in the beginning days, but I started out um, as a software engineer, actually, um, doing database work and all that kind of stuff, which was so far removed from where I ended up. But I've I always had um, kind of a, an interest in the arts and, and that creative side of things. Um, and so um, close to the year 2000, I would say, um, I saw an opening at a creative agency um, and I went for it and I got uh, hired on and originally to do just back end work, but it was a very small agency. So I ended up, as often happens in smaller companies, you kind of wear a lot of hats. And so um, I kind of got brought into that world of visual and interactive design. And, and it was there that I really started doing the work of instructional design, although at that time, I'd never heard that term. I didn't really realize that's what I was doing. But um, but yes, like working with the clients, working with SMEs, figuring out business problems and then, uh, you know, applying, doing needs analysis and applying those to the solutions that we came up with. Um, so I had a lot of fun in the corporate space doing that. Um, and as I grew with that company. I got a chance to kind of look at it from also just like the project management state of how does, you know, we, we grew quickly. So it was like doing, I ended up with a team of about 10 uh, media specialists that I was working with. And, and so I was doing like the um, contracting and project scoping and like a lot of different things like that. Um, which really helped me later on as I, as I realized like there's a whole business part of things that end up in freelance. Right. So that kind of helped me with that. Um, and I was doing, so I was doing all the things and I was loving it and, and, and having a great time. Um, but a uh, few years in uh, I decided, my husband and I, we decided uh, family was, we were, wanted to start a family. So I made the decision to stay home and I kind of took a break from all that. Um, and did the stay at home mom thing for a while. And I did some contract work here and there um, uh, during that time, but uh, primarily kind of took a break from that. And when I finally did go back into the workforce full time, I went in uh, in the K-12 sector. So totally different experience, um, but also doing ID work in that space. And it was kind of neat getting to kind of compare those two perspectives. Um there's a lot of things that were different, a lot of things that were the same. So um, it was very interesting. I had a much closer connection with my end users in that space. You get to see those aha moments. You get to see your trainings um, kind of come to life and how your your learners interact with that. Just not as easy to do in the corporate world, you know, a little bit. But um, uh, maybe if I would see my stuff out in the wild, like an exhibit uh, or something like that, and I would see users interact with it outside of like usability testing or something, that was pretty cool. But most of the time in corporate, you didn't get that opportunity. So there was some really neat experiences there, but I couldn't really grow in that area where I was. There wasn't a lot of training opportunities and that sort of thing. So I decided, well, what can I do that, um, that will let me grow and let me kind of make, you know, 
a bit more money and, and just kind of do the, you know, I really saw that I enjoyed that work, but how, how could I make that work for me in the long term? And so um, I decided to go back and get my master's in instructional design. By that point, I had heard of instructional design officially and, um, and, and realized that I, I really enjoyed those pieces of it. And I could bring in some of that multimedia experience that I had earlier um, into combining those things. So, um, so I got my master's and then uh, set off to see what that would bring. At the time, I didn't know it would be um, freelance per se, but um, in the process of figuring out like my portfolio and, 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 and all of those things, um, I kind of went in that direction. So. All right. Nice. So, so yeah, you started getting experience in these like instructional design adjacent things yes. as early as like the late nineties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Okay. So you didn't know what instructional design was at the time, yeah. but you, you're getting that creative experience, the corporate experience, building all the skills that you're kind of using on like a daily basis. Now it yeah. sounds like mm -hmm. you took a break to, um, you know, focus on your family and like mm -hmm. raise your kid, <laughs> which I know, I know other people do as well. I get emails from people who are, you know, I've been out of the workforce for a decade. I'm like coming back into ID now. So, so you've experienced that. And I know mm -hmm. you had some anxieties around that gap maybe, but it seems like with how things worked out, it hasn't really um, held you back too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been, I, I didn't know how, I didn't know what to expect uh, when I decided, you know, to, to go back in officially. Um, I know how people would take that because you hear a lot of, uh, of things, you know, people say, well, you can't, if you've had a gap in your history, you, you're not going to get hired. If you're a woman, you're not going to get hired. If you're a woman over, you know, a certain age, you're not going to get hired. And I was like, oh, great. I'm all of those things. <laughs> so I really didn't know. It was really a leap of faith. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, it's been successful. So I don't, I mean, I'm sure that there are people that have passed me over for any number of those things that I'm not aware of, you know, but it mm -hmm. doesn't, I don't need everybody to hire me, you know, <laughs> so that's okay. I've been able to, to, kind of break through those barriers that at least are barriers in my mind and and just kind of push through that yeah that's good and and do you think that your family like played a role in your decision to freelance or or can you talk more about that because it sounds like in the beginning you were like instructional design is right for me when did you decide freelance instead of full-time role actually that um that came from a conversation between you and I, Devlin, early oh. on. Uh, I was working okay. in, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know if you're aware of that, but uh, yeah. So I, I think I'm trying to remember back. I was, um, I believe I was finishing up my portfolio um, as part of your boot camp, And we were talking and I was looking at like, well, I had built my website out. I had built out like one major project for my portfolio. And I think we were talking about like what other projects might I want to showcase there. Right. And you asked me a simple question. You said, what is it that you want to do? And that, and you weren't, you weren't asking about freelance or court full time. You were asking about just like, because we were saying like, well, maybe I show storyboards in my, um, portfolio or that I can do, you know, this, that, or the other, like, what do we want to focus on? And I was really just kind of paralyzed with indecision because it occurred to me as I thought through that, like I had been in this role for so long where I had to do everything and I had to wear all of those hats that I just got in this mode of you just do it and you get it done. And I never, you know, I never really stopped to think, well, what do I enjoy doing? Um, do I do I do storyboarding because I like it or because I've just I can do it and I, it needs to get done. If I didn't do it anymore, would I miss it? Um, same thing with, you know, working with clients or doing development work, like any piece of that. I wasn't really sure. So when I started looking, I was like, I, I don't know the answer to that for myself. 
what would I enjoy? And freelancing kind of became that answer to me because it didn't pigeonhole me into any one piece of that. Mm. And so it let me kind of explore that. And then I've, I have, uh, and we can talk about this later if we'd like, but I have kind of made a evaluation tool for myself as I take on these jobs to see like, yeah. okay, how did I feel about that? So that I, maybe in the future, I can answer that question, right? And maybe start to specialize a little bit. But how did, you know, am I putting this work off because I don't really want to do it? And I get, do I get really excited about this other piece over here? And that, and, and I document that as I go, nice. because that really helps me to define that for myself. And freelancing has been, it's provided me that opportunity 100%. Okay, nice. So the freelancing was more for having that like professional flexibility, being able to take yeah. on the projects you want to take on, focus. Yes. Yeah. And as you find out what you like, be able to take on more projects like that instead of just doing whatever you're like told by someone <laughs> at right, whatever right. company <laughs> you're at with like maybe next year I'll like hop companies and um, do something different. So mm -hmm. I can see how freelancing would definitely be a good answer to that. And that's cool too. I've never heard of that. Yeah, you kind of reflect on the projects you take on, see how they make you feel. Because mm -hmm. as a freelancer, you can like set that direction. So if you're not like reflecting on these things, um, you might not be making decisions based off the best data available. Right. <laughs> so that's good. That's smart. <laughs> and I forgot to mention, yeah, if anyone here has questions, feel free to use that Q&A tab. Um, we'll make sure to get to your questions after these ones that I've, I've prepared for Nicole. So... So let's let's get a bit closer into this, into what an actual day in the life looks like for you. Um, but first, just paint the picture. Like, how did you start landing clients so quickly? Because like with you and Robbie, I know some people here saw the Q&A we did with Robbie. I'm mm -hmm. like, why, why are you all making it look so easy? Like, it, <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, it seems like, yeah, it was so fast and you were referring work out. So what do you think helped you so much? Um, with that side of things. Well, I, I don't know that I have a, a firm answer to that, yeah. <laughs> but I do know that I think it, it really helps to have a mindset going in of what you want out of freelancing, because there's, there's kind of two different ways you can approach it, right? You can approach it as this is going to be um, a kind of a gig to gig job until I get that full-time role I'm looking for, right? And that's a and that's a perfectly valid strategy. Like maybe you want to upskill in a very specific thing, or you just kind of want a little bit of extra income coming in um, as you're looking for something else, right? Um, that's perfectly or get a little bit of experience under your belt in a certain area. Or you can look at it like I did, and I think Robbie did the same thing. Um, which was helpful. And this is a business, right? I'm looking at this as a, this is my full-time job. Um, and so it it's, sets the tone as you're starting out for how you spend your time and how you upskill. So like, for example, me, like, I'm like, this is, this is my mindset. So I am going to be spending those. I gave myself a timeline. Let's set goals. So first of all, I was like, I gave myself for me, and I had this uh, opportunity and flexibility, and I was able to give myself six months up front for getting myself ready for this, right? Nice. Um, and so I spent some of that time branding, you know, creating what I, you know, my values, what my, my website, portfolio, logo, that sort of thing, but also just like opening up a business and figuring out like the the business end of things and just really what is my path forward going to be? Um, so I'm spending, whereas somebody doing the gig to gig thing might be spending that time, their time might be better spent like doing interview prep and things like that. So it's just kind of your mindset and setting that, that um, initial feel for what are you, what are you really after? And then that also helps me in determining what my, clients are. So for example, uh, looking at that going in, um, I had an opportunity just this morning, as a matter of fact, um, where somebody reached out to me for some work and I wasn't able 
to do that um, at the time, just because my client, my, my load is too heavy right now. But had I been able to, had that not been an option, I would very much have wanted to speak with them further because what they told me was like, they're looking at um, like would be, would have been looking at bringing me on um, as an ID and then kind of working with me through multiple projects and training me up in their way for doing like project management with them and the way that they do things and that sort of thing. So what that tells me right up front is that they're willing to invest into me, right? They're willing to, they're not looking for that, that quick little gig job. They're looking for a long-term contractor. So the type of work, so that, that tells me, okay, that, that's something I'm interested in learning more about. Right. Um, uh, I have, I guess to get back a little bit more um, to your question though, like what did I do aside from that planning as I also just reached out in the community. So on LinkedIn, I got my LinkedIn profile up and, and going, um, but I didn't have to do a lot of reach out, which surprised me. I thought I would be um, as far as for actual jobs. Um, I, I just, I've been very authentic in making connections with people. Um, not just not, and I don't just mean clicking the connect button on LinkedIn. I mean, like literally finding ways that we, um, have something in common and reaching out, or maybe they reach out to me and responding to that, you know, and, and, um, and really whether that's just a quick, you know, I help them here or they help me in some way, but, or just to say hi, but then um, it's more than just how many people you have following you, you know, on your LinkedIn, it's really making those connections. Those connections have helped me. They helped me get started in the beginning particularly because um, they I've had people that recommended me other IDs that maybe their workload was full, right? They couldn't get to it and they recommended me. Um, and then once I got in, you know, that, that made it easier for the next job. Right. So um, that helped. I've done that in return to people. I don't recommend, don't ever recommend somebody unless you can stand behind their work because you are putting your name and kind of attaching it to them. Um, so that may not work for everybody, but if, but if those connections are there, it definitely can kind of help in the long run. Um, so that, that was, that was helpful to get started. Um, and then once I got a few clients, kind of under my belt, the people that I started working with. Um, it was going back and really observing, like, again, not just what I liked doing as part of that, but observing them and their processes and um, how I want to work with them in the future. One thing that I've done, um, which I can get into that a little bit more, but one thing that I've done that I think has helped is I reach out about three months in advance to these contacts. Maybe it's somebody I've had to turn away, but I still keep their information, right? Still have them for later on. Um, I, or it's somebody that I'm working, you know, that's, that's come to me um, in the past. And so I've said, okay, um, I will reach out to them about three months in advance. And I'll say, I, I can't work right now, but here's what, here's what my availability is. Do you have something coming up in the next three months or the next six months even that uh, keep me in mind for? So what that does is it's, it's putting my name in front of them, right? And it goes back to that long-term versus short-term, what do you want? Because a, a, prod, a, a person, a client that's working on these bigger projects they're writing these proposals out. They're doing that three to six months in advance, right? So when they're looking at um, what ID do I want to put on this? Um, you know, what it, what work do we have? Your name is suddenly back in their inbox, right? You're coming back to mind. And so I've gotten put on projects that way. Whereas if I just reached out to them and said, okay, um, I'm done now. Do you have anything next week for me? They're, they've built those projects out. They've built their project teams out by then for those big projects. They may have that 
small piece that they want me to do some little thing that will take me two weeks and I'm done, uh, which would be good for that person looking to upskill, right? But it's not going to help me get those bigger jobs. So I think the timing on that and reaching out has really benefited me and helped me to grow that repeat work that, um, and again, I, sometimes you get to put on um, a project that's not the meatiest project in the beginning, but if you kind of feel like there's some room for growth when you first hear from these people and talk with them in those first conversations, uh, I've soon gotten put on bigger and bigger projects as I've done repeat work with people. So, you know, kind of being willing to, to do that too and look at it from the long term has helped me. Very nice. Okay. So in the beginning, focusing on longer term clients, like, yeah, you know, going into this, you're, you want to freelance full time, you're building a business, you're not doing this for the short run, like you're actually trying to build something sustainable here. And then obviously, I mean, your work speaks for itself, like your portfolio speaks for itself. So I, I think, I think Thank that's you. how, like, I know I refer to client to you like pretty early. I remember that. And like you said, I'm like, I see the work that you're doing. So send a client your way. And then, yeah, it seems like soon after that, you were sending clients back around to other people. Um, yeah. So that's good. So the referral seemed to work really well for you. Um, something that you didn't mention, but that like struck me with like how you were approaching your client work is like you were very like methodical and thorough. Like it did not seem like you were a new freelancer and obviously because of some of your early experience. But it's like I imagine that made a very big impact with the clients you were working with. It's like, wow, this person is like professional, like maybe we'll get into some of that, like what your, what your projects look like and what your process looks like. But I think if we can speak to that a little bit later, it will kind of show like, like that was bound to have made an impact. Like it, I'm sure no one got the impression you're like there to make a quick buck or anything like that. Right, it's like you're, right. you're investing in like the long term with these, these clients you're partnering with. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure that made a really big impact so that when, when they do see, Oh, I get the opportunity, you know, Nicole's schedule is opening up. It's not like, Oh, Nicole's desperate for work. It's like, yeah, Nicole is a great idea. If we don't take that spot in Nicole's schedule, like someone else is going to. So thank you mm -hmm. for giving us the heads up three <laughs> to six months in advance. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really cool seeing how you like put yourself in that kind of position. And then it's nice too. So you don't need to worry as much about like the feast and famine because like you're booking out three, six months in advance. Mm -hmm. um, so that's good. So the networking piece, yeah, very important. And, and that does seem to be what worked for you. But if you didn't have the work to back it up, like if you didn't have the strong portfolio, people may be a little bit more hesitant to refer work to you because like right. you said, when you're referring someone to someone, you don't just mm -hmm. do it because you like them. You also do right. it because you know, they'll do a good job because yeah, you're attaching your name and your credibility to that person doing a good job. Exactly. And I think that's very important too. When I'm going back to that kind of like that six months that I gave myself to get um, ready, so to speak. Um, yes, I did not post my website. I did not post my portfolio or any of that until I felt it was ready. Um, now, notice I didn't say perfect. Uh, I always have um, work that's in some various state of unfinishedness. That's not even a word. But yes, I, you know, that I'd like to do more, have spend more time and put more things on there. So my portfolio is sort of always in a constant state of, you know, progress. Um, but I made sure that I had one, like my website was solid, right? I didn't have errors. I didn't have, or not that I'm aware of. <laughs> and I, um, I made sure that, that at least that one piece, that flagship piece that I did through the boot camp, I, um, made sure it was solid. Right. So, and then, and then I spoke to my work. I explained to anybody who might be wanting to read that, you know, I explained like, here's my process. So I didn't just, you know, I didn't just put something out there and then let people wonder, like, how did I go about doing that? So, um, so I think that really helped me because I feel like a lot of, a lot of people may go to your website and if they see something they like, and you don't have a lot up there, for example, like you're going to come back and put stuff later. If they like your work, they might be willing to go back and see well, what they, you know, what they do now. But if you, if they go to your website and you've got it up there too early and you kind of rush to do that and they're not impressed with what they see, then they're not coming back. Right. So I think that really helped it was just kind of having, giving myself the time. And, and yes, I was anxious and yes, I was kind of like, Oh, 
I want to get something up. I need, I want to start getting that, getting feelers out and that kind of thing. But I think giving myself the time to get it right up front yeah. before I, I kind of launched that um, helped me because a lot of the, I would say probably 80% of the work that I got was from people contacting me through my website. Maybe they had seen it uh, through LinkedIn um, or something or got sent to it from, you know, something through LinkedIn, but they went to my website and then they filled out that contact form and that's how the communication started. So getting that website, like if they had gone there and, and, and it wasn't ready or if it was just in some half state of, you know, readiness, I would I don't think they would have taken that next step to contact me. So it was important. Nice. And yeah, when people ask me for referrals too, that's what I'm sending them. I'm like, yeah, check out Nicole, link to website. I'm not sending resumes or anything right. like that. Like, and, and again, if the website wasn't in that state you're talking about, I wouldn't be sending it. Like, oh, mm -hmm. here's like draft 0 0.5. <laughs> like yeah. some of the projects yeah. don't work, but like mm -hmm. they're really good. Trust me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Good point. Good point. And, and I know there are differing opinions about that. Yeah, it's never perfect, just like anything else. Like, you know, most things, yeah, it's like iterative. Like you got to constantly be improving it. Um, anyone who has a portfolio, I know, you know, you look back at it a week after you get it live and you're just seeing like problems with it. Right. But, <laughs> yeah. but, you def but I mean, you know, it will probably be a good idea to collect as much feedback as you can and um, make sure there aren't any like functional errors before actually like sharing mm -hmm. your, your website around. At the yeah. least. Okay, so maybe let's dive into some of the projects you take on. So people, all these people started reaching out to you. Um, yeah, what what do your projects look like? Are they super e-learning development focused? Are they instructional design? Can you paint us a picture of? So, so yeah, that's a good question. Um, because I kind of come at this as sort of wearing two hats. Like I have that ID role, and I also uh, as a former multimedia specialist, I have that development piece, right. That I, that I, that I love doing as well. So um, when I look at projects and I look at my timeline, um, a lot of times it's, I, I figure out what that is. I, those two things are very different to me. Maybe it's because I'm a methodical thinker. I don't know, but they take up different parts of my brain. So I have to really do a lot of like for writing and, um, and, and talking with SMEs and just doing the whole ID portion of things. It's, um, it's, it's, you're, you're doing some creativity there, but it's just like a whole different level of, um, thinking that I have to do. Whereas doing the development work, that's just kind of fun and I get it and I, and I get it done. Right. Like not to say it's not, you don't have to think about it and be creative, but that's, it's a different space in my mind. So when I'm looking at projects, I usually try to take on just one ID role. If it's a, if it's a major one, you know, um, and then I kind of supplement that with, um, with the development things. So kind of the things that are more quick and that I can work in, um, around that ID piece, but I'm not, I don't like when I have multiple ID roles going on at the same time, because I feel like that's stretching me a bit too thin. Yeah. So I do it that way. Another thing that I have started doing that I think has been great for me is, um, just doing QA work, which I know doesn't sound too exciting sometimes, but, um, it's, Companies that that know what IDs do and value ID work um, will often look for IDs to come and do their QA work um, because you're looking at things that um, from a different lens than just like, I mean, sometimes it's proofreading, right? But you're also looking at, you know, you're, you're looking at things like clarity of content and cohesiveness if you've got multiple um deliverables that maybe are all part of one solution, right? You're kind of able to provide that continuity and make sure that uh, that things are lining up in that way. And so it's it tells a hiring manager if they see that on your resume, that you're organized, that you're a good writer, that you're a critical thinker, 
Like it, it's, it, I think can tell a lot about you to somebody who might be seeing that on a resume. And as well, it helps. It's been great for me because what it does is it lets me, first of all, it's just like an hour here, an hour there. Like it's not intense work time-wise. So I can filter that in with other projects pretty easily. Right. But also it lets me look at what other IDs are doing and how they're approaching these solutions, um, which you don't always get the opportunity to do when you're working um, in freelance sometimes. Um, it's just neat seeing what, how other people approach problems, right? Yeah. And how they're scripting things and doing things. So it, 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 I feel like it helps me grow in, in my profession by being able to kind of see that and do that and approach ID from other perspectives. So that's been a kind of a fun thing. That's pretty recent that I've started doing and taking on work that way. Very nice. Yeah. I imagine we'll have some questions about the QA piece because we haven't explored that much on the channel before, but that does seem like a really good way to do exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Shows off your attention to detail, but also, yeah, you get exposure to all these different projects that people mm -hmm. are creating in the industry. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it seems fun. It's kind of like being like a video game reviewer. If you like video <laughs> games, it's like, let me just like review these storyboards and e-learning, review right. everyone else's work. Right. As you're kind of getting inspiration and doing like your own professional development, maybe as you're mm -hmm. doing that. So that's a really good point. I'm sure people will be curious how you like came to land that type of opportunity. Um, I can totally relate with the ID and e-learning development piece. Um, when I had a lot of ID client projects going on at once, like that would definitely be the most like mentally draining. Like I could sit on my computer for like 12 hours a day and like storyline. But if it <laughs> comes to like writing storyboards, it's like I got a couple hours, a few hours a day in me and my right. brain is like ready for a break mm -hmm, for like exactly. a week. <laughs> not actually, but, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's more like mentally taxing and maybe it's not mm -hmm. like that for everyone, but I can, I can definitely relate to that piece. Um, and then what about the work you've been doing for the boot camp? Because I know we didn't talk about that. And to give people context, I guess maybe in January, you started helping with giving feedback and then even like doing coaching and one-on-ones. So how does that fit into, um, yeah, the, like the coaching, like you do that as well as part of your the projects you take on? Right, right. Um, I have loved doing that. That's one of my favorite things that I've enjoyed doing. because And, and it goes back to what I was just saying about um the benefits of some of that QA piece, right? Yeah, Where it's kind of like the I, same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I get to really, I'm, I meet wonderful people. It helps with the connections. Right. But I also, everybody coming in, I get to work with all these practitioners that are coming into this field with so much from different perspectives and with so much to offer from their viewpoints. Right. So they're creating these projects that are, Kind of an extension of them and their interest in what you know what they've been doing and what they're you know something that kind of talks about them a little bit right and so uh i don't i i, I don't get to I, again you don't see that in an everyday role so it gives me that exposure to really be able to help you know for myself that's kind of neat and it, it is nice being able to kind of provide, a, you know, some help and, and see other people make the best of what, you know, what they've got and then kind of move and, and grow in their in their own space in that way. So I've really enjoyed that. Um, and it's also one of those things where I can schedule that within my week. Um, it's an hour here, an hour there. Um, it's not it's not something that's like all encompassing. So it's very yeah. easy to kind of work that in to my current workload um, and, and still be successful with that and provide help to other people. So it's been, it's been really fun. Very nice. Okay. So yeah, because you do have a very heavy like client load lately, it seemed like, like mm -hmm. since this is all really picked up. So let's get into what we're all here for the title of the session. Mm -hmm. What does, a typical day look like for you with all of this going on all of these different projects and growing your business yeah um what does a typical day look like for you maybe you want to paint us a few different days because i know i'm sh it can vary a lot but yeah however you want to take well, this question sure like well so i think for me so i'm I, I do most of my work from home so i have you know a home office 
So for me, it's very important to have kind of a, a standard set for a routine in my day so that there's clear balance and distinction between this is my work day and this is my family life, right? <laughs> my after work day. So, um, so I, um, have a very set routine. Like I kind of have work hours and here's when I do what and that sort of thing. So that's helped for one thing. And I, and I try to, and I try to work, it, it allows me to set kind of a, um, time for my clients to say, here's when I'm available for client meetings and that sort of thing. So it, it keeps that easy to say, these are, these are my times. But so I, in the mornings I look and I see what are my meetings for the day? There's a lot of meetings in my day. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm meeting about the meeting, right? But, um, yeah. but, but it's good. Um, so what kind of meetings do I, so I look at, I look at my schedule in the mornings and it, and if there's anything that needs to be shown. Maybe I'm demoing a prototype to a customer. Uh, maybe I'm going to be doing a SME interview and I need to come up with some questions that's preparing for that meeting. So I make sure those things have that priority if, if, if not already. And then I, um, I look at what my meetings are for the day and figure out how much kind of work time is, is, is within the, around that. Um, what kind of meetings I have might be interesting just because that's, is all ID related. So I, I usually work with, it's kind of like one of four different kinds of meetings, right? I may have a meeting with, um, my project team. So sometimes depending on the role, I may do, I may wear the whole hat. Like I may, I may do things from start to finish. A lot of times I get the benefit of working with teams. So there may, so we have to meet with the whole project team, whether it's um, maybe a creative director, the project manager, myself, whoever's involved in that project. We have weekly meetings usually uh, just to make sure that we're keeping up. Like we know the status of the project. If it needs to change hands at any point, or if anybody's running behind on a certain piece of it, we're all in the loop on that. So there's those kinds of meetings. There's week, usually weekly meetings with the client. So it's client check-in, right? Just where, where are we on this? What's in review with you? What are we working on? Are there any questions? So those are another type of meeting. Um, and then sometimes I will, I will not be the only ID on a project. I will be, I'm working on a project right now where I'm one of three. And so we will have our own meetings sometimes because, and that's, very important because we're working on a solution that has multiple pieces and parts. And you don't want that client telling one person, one ID, um, hey, um, we're not using this term anymore, for example. Because oftentimes we find our clients are in some sort of state of flux as we're working through these things. We're kind of working it hand in hand. Um, they're saying, oh, we're, we're changing our branding or we're changing our methods or we're, and we're not really sure what that's going to look like yet. So we're working through these questions and things with our clients as we go. And um, and so it needs to be it's important that our voice on all these pieces are the same. And if we have one ID that their materials have all the new terminology and she didn't reflect that to the rest of us then it, that's frustrating for the client. And then we've got to make changes and time is taken down the road. Right. So we have, we have regular meetings amongst the IDs to make sure we're, we're keeping that continuity across all deliverables uh, for what we're doing. So that takes up some time. Um, but it's cool too, because you're really, learning from each other. Right. And, and kind of, we, we brainstorm a lot off of each other and, and how we might want to do these uh, deliverables and that sort of thing. Um, and then just like one-on-one -on -one SME meetings and things like that, where I'm meeting with them and discovery and that sort of thing. Um, so those are the types of meetings that take up a lot of my day. <laughs> um, and then project wise, like, Right now I'm working, I'm doing um, 
like I just finished working through a bunch of transcripts. So I've had the discovery with a client. And in this case, it's a pretty big project. So I have, there's a lot of SMEs involved in different pieces and parts of it. Um, and so there's probably, I mean, there's several hours worth of discussions that we've had with them and, you know, pulling this information out. And so I've gone through these transcripts and I'm, and I'm kind of coding the data and I'm looking at it and figuring out what's important, what are the key takeaways, where, and, and kind of trying to form a design document and outline of what, what this training might look like. Um, so that's, that's the, kind of a, an inside look at that piece. And then I'm working on, like I said, multiple, a project with multiple IDs where um, I'm building, like there's an e-learning component. I'm building um, an instructor-led training. So there, there's like facilitator guide. Uh, and then there's going to be some handouts and things for the users of this piece to actually work through um, as they're as they're going like in person, kind of a cohort style thing. So I'm working through like creating the script for that and like guided questions for these activities. So I'm going back and forth with the SMEs. Like what are what are some scenarios that we can build out around this that would make a good hands-on activity, right? And then writing that out. So that is that piece. Um, and then, like I said, development QA work um, always comes in there, uh, here and there as I as I can. So, if that nice. does that help? Yeah. <laughs> Gave you a lot of information there. Yeah, that was a lot, but I, I think it's good, be, um, especially like you mentioning how many meetings there are, because I think a common misconception maybe is that when you're working as a freelancer, like you're kind of alone in a bubble all day. And you don't really have a lot of interaction with like other instructional designers or, or other teams or anything like that. Right. So that's a common concern. I get people are like, I'm interested in freelancing, but like I want to I want to work with the team. But it sounds like you work with quite large teams, project teams, other mm -hmm. instructional designers, subject matter experts. Uh, I don't yeah. think you mentioned this one, but I'm sure you do like discovery calls, too, I would imagine with like yes. new potential new clients. So that's another type of yes. meeting you've got in the mix, closing new mm -hmm. business um, mm -hmm. and then meeting with like your clients, clients you know, if you're, if you're subcontracting. So mm -hmm. lots of meetings <laughs> um, for sure. So I don't know if that came as a surprise to anyone here. And then, it, and then, as you said, yeah, you kind of, between your meetings, you're kind of working on these different deliverables that I'm sure you have prioritized by like, what needs to get done first? Yeah. What are the most right. pressing deadlines? What am I going to have like the mental energy for between these meetings today? Um, and, you know. and I do have to, so that I can have that kind of heads down time and get, get the work done and not just meet about it. Right. Uh, I do schedule, I try to schedule as much as possible um, one to two days a week that are meeting free. Like all the meetings happen, you know, at a certain time of the week nice. yeah. um, we get those kind of wrapped up up front. And then the rest of the week is kind of like, if I need, if I have a question, you know, we can reach out via email or something like that. Um, it's fairly quick touch points, but I'm, I, I have to give myself that time to just really sit down and focus on the work itself. Um, and, and so, yeah, so it's important to, and I, I always sit down on Mondays and schedule, I try to schedule my meetings for the week. And like I said, it, most of these meetings are kind of standing meetings. Here's when during the week they're going to happen. So that it's not coming at you as a surprise. Once that starts happening, then you can get sucked into uh, a world of hurt really quickly, I think. I think ha the key to, for me has been being able to plan. This is this is what my workload looks like in advance for that kind of that weekly picture. Yeah. Um, so it, it's very it's helpful. But I found that most of the clients that I work with, they kind of work that same way. They, they want that planning. They need that for their own schedules. So that's not been, if they don't already have that in place um, and I've requested that it's, I rarely get any pushback on that. Nice. Okay. And I want to check in with two. I mean, we have 15 minutes left in this session. I should have asked you this before. Do you think, I mean, I, I was going to hop in a discussion table um, 
after this just to ask questions from people who may have any do you do you is this a hard should we do a hard stop in 15 minutes do you have another meeting or work i don't know i actually don't have another meeting so we're okay. good because <laughs> i know we still have some questions prepared here and you're giving us really deep answers and i know people yeah. appreciate that but i'm seeing great questions come in too so maybe okay. we can each hang out at a separate discussion table after this in case people want to um, ask questions after the this live session sure we have cool. to do that okay. maybe just for 30 minutes or so okay yeah, thank yeah. you, everyone. Thanks for being patient. Um, yeah, Nicole's given some really yeah. deep answers, though. I want to make sure we do them. <laughs> oh, <yeah. justice. laughs> I'll try to stop talking so much so I can answer some of these questions. Yeah, I know we have questions about like your portfolio and stuff, so I'm okay. sure you'll get some questions about that. But we will um, maybe just finish off with these freelancer ones. Um, yeah, is, is freelancing what you expected it to be? I guess let's go there next. Like you. And just to yep. kind of recap to what you mentioned, you, so you are working on this variety of projects. You're working with a bunch of different teams, seeing how the industry kind of works. Um, how do you feel about freelancing now that you've been doing it for a good while now, probably about a year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, given the caveat that I was somewhat fuzzy going in about what my expectations were, yeah. then uh, <laughs> yes, I would say that I've, that it's, more or less what I expected it to be. I think it goes back to, to that. I was, I was very comfortable in the business side of it though. Um, so writing those proposals, working with budget, working with different resources. And I had gotten that project management experience where I was juggling multiple projects, multiple resources on projects and I, and, and yeah, it had been a while since I had done that. So I sort of had to get jump back into that a little bit, but at the yeah. same time, um, it wasn't a huge surprise to me that this is how, you know, there's a lot of things coming at me at one time, but I think that could be a huge surprise to some people if you're not used to that. Right. Yeah. Um, but I sort of expected that that would be coming with it. And so that didn't really surprise me. Um, and I think, I think if, if anything, I was, I, the thing that has been, I don't know if it's frustrating is the right word. I think it's just the fact that there's so much uncertainty that comes with it. Yeah. Um, Cause even though I'm getting all of these projects and they're kind of coming in steadily, I've been blessed in that regard. Um, you always sort of have this picture or this voice that says, Oh gosh, this could stop at any moment. Right. Um, and so like when, is, is this, how long is this going to go? You know? Yeah. And so, so there's a little bit of uncertainty there, but um, I've been pleasantly surprised that at the steadiness of it all, because when I first started, I was very skeptical and worried that like, oh, gosh, I could not even picture myself with one client, much yeah. less having <laughs> to turn people away. You know, it was, it was very intimidating jumping into it. So I'm, I'm happy that it's ended up being what I hoped it would be. That's good. Yeah. I could see how that past experience would help. I didn't fully understand like the scope of your past experience, like when we were working together. And so then when you started like landing clients and we're just having conversations about like the proposals you're sending out and like the deliverables that you're like working in, I'm like, I mean, just because when I started freelancing, <laughs> I was like out of school, you know, I was like, I had never really had like an actual full time job. I was like figuring out the business side as I was figuring, you know, as I was building my skills. So then I was like, w why does it seem like you've been doing this for like years? <laughs> I was like, but that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, that that past experience helped a lot. So that's good. And so now, I mean, maybe we should kind of announce announce this it's kind of a fun <laughs> surprise, but like what what's kind of next on the horizon, maybe later this year, you're gonna be kind of helping other people build their freelance businesses, it sounds like. <laughs> um yeah, so so as I mentioned earlier, like I've, I've been loving one of my favorite things has been working with the boot camp and working with the people in the community and kind of helping out as a, as a boot camp pro um, and getting those perspectives and meeting those people. It's just been very exciting. Um, and so um, I'm very excited to announce that uh, I'm <laughs> starting this this summer, I'm going to be doing that in a in a full time capacity as part of uh, 
Devlin's team. So yeah, 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 yeah. it's very exciting. So yay. Yeah. So um, Nicole will be, um, yeah, she'll not just like helping out like in the paid bootcamp, but also we'll have Nicole like creating some content for the YouTube channel on how to use like some design tools, how to build the freelance biz, um, just like instructional design stuff too. Like Nicole has like a very well-rounded skill set. So she's going to help with like coaching, free content, and she's going to help us on the back end doing some instructional design for like new programs we're bringing out too. So yeah, I'm super excited about it. I, I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. Yeah, the boot, you know, the biz, everything is growing. So we're happy to have Nicole on board and you'll probably all be seeing more of Nicole um, <laughs> in a variety of capacities over the coming months and and hopefully, I would imagine, years. So <laughs> um, going to be good. It's a lot yeah, of so opportunity. <laughs> yeah, so Nicole will be yeah. here to help support all of you um, a lot more often than this single Q&A. So very cool. Um, and then maybe we should... I mean, I have some more questions here, but let's try to get to a few of the most upvoted questions from the audience um, before diving into this. And, and we'll see what more questions people have after sure. the session ends. Does that sound good to you all? All right, let's dive into it. So the top question is from Debbie. Um, what resources, if any, did you use to teach yourself how to run a business? Also, any legal resources? It sounds like you leaned on your lived experience pretty heavily yeah, but well, pretty much i i don't i don't recall any specific resources that i used um that's a great question i think it just kind of came um like i said as part of as part of my lived experience so i kind of got it here and there but um i think if anything it was more researching maybe just how to manage it like the technology i might use like what programs might i want to use for contracts or invoicing or things like that because there was you know there's that whole piece of it so kind of figuring out what um i wanted to do and what that looked like and then kind of applying my branding to it and just making sure i thought through all of those things in advance before those projects started or contract opportunities started rolling in uh, so I was good, set to go, you know, when they when they hit um, helped me. Um, but but no, no specific resources. Sorry. All right. No worries. Um, I'm, maybe some people here in the chat have some that they can share with you, Debbie. Yeah. And if not, ask in the Slack. I know I know people have some good stuff to share. Mm -hmm. um, and then Chris, I think, yeah, Chris, you mentioned that your question got answered. It was about the best way to find clients as a freelancer. We have questions about your portfolio website. Was it built with WordPress? I think you built it with Webflow. No, right? I built it with Webflow. Ground yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Jasmine about how you uh, found that QA work. Did it kind of fall in your lap like the others or did you oh, seek it out? Yeah, good question. No, actually that. So one of the things I always do um, when I'm looking at future work when it's somebody that I've worked with is I ask for a retrospective at the end of that project. And most companies are willing to give it to me because they're, they're wanting to, and they want you to have a good experience. Right. That, and so that tells me something right there. If they don't want to do that, like, mm, I don't know how I feel about doing future work with them, but um, I had an opportunity in that retrospective and, it, and it's just talking about like what worked well, what didn't work well, what can we improve upon in the next project? Right. And in various ways. And so um, one of the things, it was a project I had finished and I was had an opportunity to just kind of sit with that client. We weren't looking at um, a specific project. We were just kind of talking back and forth and I, and they were like, well, what do you, you know, it, it gave me an opportunity to say, Hey, I've, they, they're very aware that as freelancers, you have a choice in who you work for, right? So, so it's a two-way street, you know, they, yeah. you're hoping, you know, it's very much like an interview, you know, you're, you have the opportunity to say no to them as much as they have the opportunity to not offer you something, right? And so um, as often as can kind of sit down with them and talk with them. And I was talking with them and I, and I, and they were like, what is it that you that, that you're good at, or do you have any questions else for us? And I brought that up and I said, you know, I did QA a good bit in my 
former job uh, as a media specialist. I mean, it, it was kind of funny that it was kind of said it doesn't go out the door until she's seen it because I just have some weird freaky way of being able to spot things that, that, um, that wow. that's a weird skill. So anyway, so that kind of developed over time. And so I mentioned that to this customer and I said, Hey, just, if you're looking for that, um, I happen to be pretty good at it. And, um, and so within probably two days, two or three days after that conversation, they, um, said, Hey, we got a job for you. Are you interested in doing QA? Brilliant. And so, nice. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, it's like a hundred hours over the course of the project. Wow. Just QA work. So it, wow. it can add up and be really, really profitable as well as, you know, beneficial too. So. Very well done. So yeah, building that relationship, seeing what the client needs and then turning it into an offer because you already have trust with them. So very cool. It's not like you're like out on a job board looking for QA work. It's coming right. from the relationships that you're building. So mm -hmm. Right. Great example of that. But um, those retrospectives do that <laughs> anytime yeah, you get I, a I chance. Imagine that's a, something there's good great to opportunity there. there. Discuss more. Yeah, we haven't talked about that much on the channel either before, but I can see how valuable that would be. So project retrospectives. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, maybe we have time for one or two quick questions before we break out into the discussion tables. Um, we have a question from Heidi about is freelancing what you were expecting financially, if you feel comfortable. Um, and um, piece. yeah, I, uh, I didn't really know what to expect financially. I had heard that there was great opportunity. Um, but I've been, I've been very pleasantly surprised. It has, <laughs> it has worked out financially for me. Um, it's exceeded my expectations a little bit, but that being said, I will say in the beginning, it can be rough because, yeah. Free, freelancing to get started, there are a lot of upfront cost, and you don't get paid. Uh, most cases, if you're lucky, you're you're getting paid maybe 30 days after you do the actual work. So there's, you need to be able, or I recommend that you be able to float several months uh, out of the gate. Once you start getting that work coming in pretty steadily, then yeah, the payoff was pretty nice, <laughs> you know, um, being able to to get that and coming in, especially when you can work in kind of those multiple jobs at at once and be able to support that um, and still provide that good value to each job and your customer. Um, it it helps for sure. Yeah. And I can talk about that more at a table if you'd like. Cool. Yeah, good response. Yeah, it is rough in the beginning. Um... Yeah, you got to bear those costs. You got to make sure you have runway so you're not like desperately taking on like anything at all for any rates at all. You do mm -hmm. want to have some kind of um, bargaining power. And if you, if you're, you know, need that project to kind of pay your bills, uh, it doesn't put you in a very good position. So you're having several months at least kind of mm -hmm. in the bank to have you covered while you get the business started obviously helps a lot having that safety net. Yes. So, um, so yeah, let's maybe close down the main session. Um, we'll hop into some live discussion tables uh, if you want to chat with us further. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Nicole, for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank Great you, questions. Devlin. Thanks for having okay. me. Thank you all. Okay, so Nicole and I will each be at a discussion table if you want to keep the conversation going. Thanks for all the applause emojis for Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> Always love to see them. All right, talk to you all soon. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Thanks.